The world is full of strange and bizarre occurrences, although most of the time the answers to these mysteries are fairly simple. Occam's razor is a scientific principle and philosophical rule best described by Sherlock Holmes when he said, when you have eliminated all the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. But remember, first you have to eliminate the impossible. Hi folks, I'm Johnny and welcome to The Oddest. Back in 1928, one of the richest men in the world would be taking a routine flight on his private plane. He would close the book that he was reading and excuse himself as he needed to visit the men's room. He never returned. In fact, he was no longer aboard the plane. Let's take a wee trip together into the curious case of Alfred Lowenstein. Alfred Lowenstein was born in 1877 in Brussels, Belgium. His father Bernard was a German Jewish financier. So when Alfred was around 20 years old, he followed in his father's footsteps and began his journey into the world of finance. He established the Belgian-based banking project called Société Internationale de Energie Hydroelectrique, which targeted developing nations across the globe. This meant providing third world countries with electric power. This endeavour soon made him a very wealthy man. Although he was considered by many to be eccentric and a bit of a loose cannon, he would predict market trends and stock values with eerie foresight. As an example, he invested heavily in synthetic silk for the commodity's value to skyrocket right after. Sure, he was known as eccentric, but he was now one of the world's richest men. So he's allowed to be, right? He had a fascination with all things aviation. The man loved to fly. And as one of the richest men on the planet, of course he had his own plane. In fact, he had hundreds of flights under his belt. In 1908, Lowenstein married Marilyn Misson. She was from a prominent Belgian family. They would go on to have a son together. Although it was widely known that this was a marriage of convenience. Basically, his wife loved the luxurious lifestyle that Alfred offered and Alfred enjoyed having a trophy wife. Although there were some speculation about Alfred's sexuality, it was apparent that this was not the reason for this hologram of a marriage. It was purely because Alfred was obsessed with finance. It's all he ever thought about, talked about. It was his main passion. Well, that and horses. In the early evening of the 4th of July in Croydon Airport in England, Lowenstein's private plane was idling, waiting their passenger's arrival. Soon, two black limousines arrived and the occupants got out and boarded the plane, being welcomed by the pilot, Donald Drew, who was standing at the plane door to greet them. Prior to boarding the plane, Lowenstein had quickly popped into the terminal to make a phone call to Sir Robert Holt. He was a Canadian financial magnate. This call was to arrange a dinner appointment with him the next week. The people that joined Lowenstein on the plane were the pilot, Donald Drew, the mechanic, Robert Little, his valet, Fred Baxter, secretary, Arthur Hodgson, and stenographers, Eileen Clark and Paula Bedallin. The pilot spoke to the passengers prior to takeoff. He assured them that it was an ideal evening to fly. The skies were clear and the weather forecast was perfect. As such, it was set to be a smooth, uneventful flight. Smooth, maybe. Uneventful, definitely not. The plane, a Fokker tri-motor, had some adjustments to the interior, specifically for Lowenstein. He had part of the cabin made into a functioning office. He had his own seat, which was upholstered and was situated at the front of the cabin facing backwards. The plane was also outfitted with soundproofing. This was so that Lowenstein could dictate to his stenographers and can be heard over the roar of the engines. Between the cockpit and the main cabin, there was also a glass partition. This was so that the pilot and the mechanic could easily turn and see the cabin right to the rear of the plane. Towards the rear of the plane was a door. This door leads to a small lobby and to the only door in or out of the plane. To the left is also a small toilet. To save space, it's designed in such a way that once you enter the loo, the lobby door opens fully locking across the lavatory door. This now becomes the toilet door. The flight took off from Croydon at 6 p.m where they would fly across the English Channel to Brussels. Well, that was the intended destination anyway. 
what could possibly go wrong? Once the plane was up in the sky and was crossing the English Channel, Lowenstein, who until now was sitting reading a book, placed his book on the table and stood up. He excused himself and walked towards the toilet. After about 10 minutes or so, people started to wonder if he was okay. So his valet, Fred Baxter, went into the lounge and knocked on the toilet door. Hearing no response and fearing the worst, he was able to get the door open. And what did he find? Nothing. Lowenstein had vanished. Baffled by this, Baxter got the attention of Lowenstein's secretary, Arthur Hodgson, who also checked out the toilet. You know, just in case Baxter was lying. He wrote a wee note to explain the situation and passed it to the pilot. It obviously makes sense to land the plane immediately. So with that being said, there was an airport, St. Ingelver in France, pretty much straight ahead on their flight path and it was only a few minutes away. But in a move that made zero sense, the pilot turned the plane back on itself and flew towards the French coast and landed on a beach at Dunkirk. This beach was under the strict control of the French military. A short distance away was Fort Mardic. An officer there, Lieutenant Marquis, had ordered a group of military police to attend the beach and apprehend whoever had landed there. They were transported back to Mardic and questioned by Marquis and the police. The next day, Marquis had revealed to the press that they had the passengers and pilot in custody to ascertain the reasons for illegally landing on French soil. He also revealed that, although their reason for doing this was because they had lost their employer somewhere over the English Channel, it took them over half an hour to reveal Lowenstein's name to the authorities. It was reported that Hodgson had been sweating profusely. Baxter's teeth were chattering and both stenographers wouldn't stop crying. With that being said, Marquis also reported that he believed the passenger's story, saying, It could not have been play acting. It would have been impossible for those on the aircraft to have acted as they did if Lowenstein had not met with some terrible fate. Less than 24 hours after the plane landed on the Dunkirk beach, any official investigations by the French had ceased. This was pretty much because technically whatever happened to Lowenstein happened out with the territory limit. The French basically said it wasn't their jurisdiction. The British and the Belgian authorities claimed the same thing. That's called a pass in the buck. So basically, no one was interested in solving what had happened to Alfred. All governments in the vicinity were like... The only person on the planet that seemed to give a shit and was wanting answers was his wife, Madeline. Now, this could be because there's a wee caveat in Belgian law that says without an actual body, a death certificate cannot be issued. Then, without a death certificate, the will can't come into effect or be read. This essentially means that Lowenstein's entire estate would be frozen for a period of no less than four years. So Madeline needed a body. She issued a reward to French authorities if they took up the search. As you can imagine, this soon became global news and a case that was already bonkers became even more outrageous when newspapers started to print their conspiracy theories. The Exchange Telegraph printed that a French fisherman witnessed a parachute opening around the same time and location as Lowenstein would have been overhead. He further claimed that a few moments later a yacht was seen racing out to collect him. The New York Times reported that a car had arrived on the beach and had driven Lowenstein away. The Gazette had put forth the idea that maybe Lowenstein was simply never on the plane. My favourite one though, is another French newspaper reported that Lowenstein was having an affair with an inmate at an insane asylum and this stunt was used to cover up to hide the fact that they had eloped together. Besides all of these crazy theories, the reality of it all is that two weeks had passed and there was still no sign of Lowenstein. Then, on the 19th of July, a wee French fishing boat with two fishermen discovered a decomposing body around 10 miles off the coast of France. It was reported that the body was so badly bloated and decomposed that the men couldn't keep it on the deck of the small boat due to the smell. So they wrapped the body in a sail, attached it to a line, and threw it back overboard so they could tow it back to shore. The unidentified body was male and was wearing silk underwear and socks. He was wearing a wristwatch and further inspection revealed that it bore the inscription of his name, that being Alfred Lowenstein. The body was unidentified 
no more. The Lowenstein family hired a private coroner to perform an independent autopsy. Another strange fact on this case was that for reasons unbeknownst to anyone, the autopsy report wasn't released for another two months. The pathologist discovered a large wound in Lowenstein's stomach and that every bone in his body was broken. Despite the condition of the body and the time passed in finding him, the investigation was able to determine that Lowenstein was still alive when he struck the water. The cause of death was ruled due to the impact from falling over 4,000 feet. Hitting water from that height was the same effect as hitting solid ground. Lowenstein was buried in a cemetery in Brussels, in a tomb belonging to his wife's family, the Masons. However, his name was never carved on the slab that covered his casket, so he was, in effect, buried in an unmarked grave. So the main theory is that whilst he was walking to the bathroom, he had accidentally opened the wrong door and fell out of the plane. The New York Times later reported that Lowenstein was growing increasingly absent-minded and that people close to him had said that he would blunder through wrong doors in his home or office whilst his mind was occupied with grandiose schemes. I mean, come on, that's just a wee bit convenient, don't you think? There's a huge difference from walking into a closet by mistake and stepping out of a plane at 4,000 feet. The reason that this was the most popular theory is because that's the story that everyone on board stuck to. Or agreed to stick to. So at some point, the pilot and the mechanic had to fly the plane back to England. It was later reported in court that during this time, they agreed to perform a wee test. So once they were at the same height and airspeed as they were back on July 4th, they then opened the plane door just to see if it was possible. They reported to the judge that not only was it possible, but they were able to do it with ease. The problem is, because there were no other qualified witnesses or professionals in court that day to contest this information, the judge had no choice but to take the men at their word. Most, if not all, of the aviation world at the time called bullshit on that. There was never any instance of anyone ever having falling out of any plane door. Plus, both the toilet door and the door to the plane looked nothing alike. The plane door had a clear window on it for a start. A popular aeroplane publication commented on the case, saying, Everyone who knew the machine agreed that the door never opened by accident. Major Jai P. Cooper was the chief inspector of the UK Air Ministry at the time. He carried out a wee investigation of his own, and after thoroughly inspecting the door, he found that it was in perfect working order and showed no faults of any kind. RAF pilot George Terrell was asked to comment by a Toronto-based newspaper. He reported, Even if a man could get the door open, a super strong man, as soon as the pressure was released, the door would slam shut. Furthermore, as soon as the outside door was opened, the slightest bit, everyone inside would be aware of it. A blast of wind would blow through the cabin. No passengers reported any such event. None of them heard any kind of noise or felt the sensation of wind. It was also reported that although Lowenstein was considered to be a physically strong person, he had been ill in the weeks leading up to the flight with rheumatoid arthritis, which would make him physically weaker than normal. Even if he was in peak physical condition, it was deemed almost impossible for him to be able to open that door, especially by accident. An investigative reporter for the Evening Standard, Norman Ray, in efforts to uncover the truth, conducted his own experiments on a similar model aircraft. Whilst in flight, he couldn't even get the door to budge a little bit, even when he put all of his body weight behind it and tried with all of his strength. So I think it's safe to say that Lowenstein didn't accidentally fall out of that door. The second theory is that Lowenstein took his own life leaping from the plane. It was also reported that he was in a lot of financial trouble and the pressure just got to him. There's several issues with this theory. The obvious one is that all of the reasons why the first theory was debunked still holds up here. He would not be able to open the door. At all. And if by some miracle he did, still, he couldn't have done it undetected. Also, if this was his plan, then why did he stop at the terminal prior to the flight to make a phone call to arrange a dinner for the very next week? When the plane had landed on the beach, the mechanic, Robert Little, found handwritten notes by Lowenstein on his table. These notes were about money in and out, plus business plans and ideas going forward. This certainly doesn't sound like someone that was moments away from leaping to his own death on purpose. So that rules out accident and suicide. Let's take a wee look at another theory. That Alfred Lowenstein was murdered. 
Many people involved in the investigation have said that although it's pretty impossible for someone to open the door mid-flight, it would be possible for two men working together to get the door open. Let's also have a wee look at the behaviour of the other crew and passengers on this strange flight. Apparently, it was a known fact and even printed in Lowenstein's obituary that he wasn't into reading and has never read a book. Yet the passengers reported that he was reading a book before he got up to visit the bathroom. Also, why did the plane refuse to land at the nearby airport that was straight ahead and turn around to land on the beach? Lowenstein was also renowned for being teetotal. He never drank alcohol yet the coroner found an amount of alcohol in his system. Let's look at a few points that support this theory. So years later, prior to his death, the mechanic Robert Little was married to a wee wife called Julie Little. And Robert told her a very intriguing story. He said that around the time of the incident, he was sitting in the cockpit at his station. He had glanced around through the clear partition and saw Lowenstein suddenly standing up, removing his jacket, collar and tie, he said that he looked like he was choking or gasping for air. He told his wife that he had suspected Lowenstein had been poisoned. If this theory holds up and he was in fact murdered, then that poses another two major questions. Who done it and why? Let's take a wee look at the suspects. So obviously the suspects are the people on the plane with Lowenstein, but let's look at the crew for a minute. So Robert Little, the mechanic, reported that he was at the controls during this incident. But that's not accurate. He had passed his control over to Donald Drew, the pilot, as soon as he noticed Lonestein was missing. This also means that it was Drew's sole decision to land on that beach instead of the airport. Also, why did neither pilot nor mechanic use the radio system to inform anyone else that someone had fallen from the plane? Drew also had given contradicting stories as to whether or not he actually turned the plane around to look for Lonestein prior to landing on the beach. In my experience, when people's statements change, that's not a good sign. Also, remember I mentioned a short time after landing, Robert Little had discovered handwritten notes made by Lowenstein. Well, these were never handed in to the authorities. Some investigators speculate that this could be because the notes could make the suicide theory more implausible and it's thought that he took the notes to reinforce the suicide theory and steer people away from the idea that he was murdered. Remember also that the crew testified to a Belgian judge that they were able to open the plane door whilst flying back to England, an act that we've already discovered would be impossible. Therefore, they must have been lying. Anyway, if one or two or more people on that plane were party to this murder of Lowenstein, that would mean that everyone on board would be complicit and would need to take a vow of silence. Later on, a book was published called The Man Who Fell From The Sky by the author William Norris. He says in that book that someone likely paid everyone off. Money is always a great motivator. So now the big question is, who? The obvious one that comes to mind is Lowenstein's wife. She was the one who would gain the most from his death, although it was reported that they did have a good relationship. As you can imagine, a tycoon of his stature had many business relationships. There were no shortage of people who would have liked to have seen Lowenstein gone. Lowenstein was a major stockholder in a company called International Holdings, along with his partners, Frederick Servasi and Major Albert Palm. With Lowenstein gone, the other two would see massive financial gain. After Lowenstein's departure from the world, the stock crashed considerably. If a person or persons had advanced knowledge of this event, they would make a killing, no pun intended. The author that I mentioned earlier, Norris, during his research, discovered that Zervasi and Pam made a massive profit and announced this from transactions of a special nature. The profits were over $13 million, which by today's standards is around $200 million. There's another theory, and this one is very interesting. This theory goes back to the idea that Lowenstein's wife had hired the crew to kill her husband and that she subsequently paid off the rest of the staff. It was suggested that mid-flight, the crew of the plane actually removed the door completely, allowing them to dispose of a heavily intoxicated Lowenstein. And this is why they landed on the beach instead of the airport, so that they could replace the door quickly without being detected. Crime writers Robert and Carol Bridgestock have speculated that Lowenstein faked his own death and disappeared because of the financial irregularities in his businesses. 
This theory is supported by the fact that the body was buried in an unmarked grave and that his wife did not attend the funeral. Almost a hundred years ago, that private plane landed on that beach at Dunkirk. No one could have imagined the mystery that was about to unfold, whether it was by murder, by accident, or by his own hand. One of the richest men in the world would be dead. The six people that were with him that day have all since passed away. So the curious case of Alfred Lowenstein is truly an unsolved mystery. So there you have it. I don't know about you, but I am away for a cup of tea. If you're still here, I want to thank you all so very much for hanging out with me today. Please stay safe out there, folks. And remember, above all else, keep smiling. <laughs>